Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Elite Dangerous live stream. This is episode two of Discovery Scanner, yep. a live stream series all about taking deep dives behind the scenes uh, with Elite Dangerous and looking at some of the cool features in Elite Dangerous and how they're brought to life for you guys to enjoy uh, at home. Uh, today with me, uh, I have been joined by Mark Allen, uh, who is a lead programmer here at yep. Frontier Developments. Yes, I've been leading the Elite Gameplay team since shortly after a Kickstarter finished. That's pretty exciting stuff. Um, actually, have my 10th anniversary at the company this week. Congratulations, round right. of applause, everybody, straight away from Mark <laughs> Allen. I shouldn't have left for that. 10th, 10th anniversary? Yep, 10 wow. years on Monday. So they've kept you around for a reason? So I get told, yeah. And we're going to learn a little bit about that reason today because Mark is going to show you, uh, well, today's topic is going to be the Thargons. Something that you were quite proud of uh, is the sort of, uh, well, we'll go into lots of detail about exactly what it is that you, you've done, but um, is the, the behavioural patterns and the way yeah. they move and feel in the game. So obviously with something like Thargons, there's so much work that comes from artists and the, especially visual effects on the Thargons. But all of the motion, their swarming, their formations, that's all stuff that I've worked on and I'm pretty proud of. And that's what I'm going to be talking about for the next, as long as we can. Yes, so the Thargons, obviously, uh, the Thargoids, uh, one of the Thargoids' weaponry, right? Would you, yes. would, you, would you suggest that? They're beautiful looking swarms that uh, are incredibly deadly too. Uh, and uh, a lot of interesting thought has gone into uh, what, what makes them work. Uh, and brings them to life and makes them this exciting sort of gameplay thing that you can, you can get involved with. A lot of people have seen the Thargoids and, and had those interactions with those Thargoids and these, these giant hulking ships, uh, but you don't often get to see the Thargons close up, and tonight we'll be showing the Thargons yep. uh, in a way you've never seen it before. So do stick around, we're going to be doing some uh, behind-the-scenes uh, actual live yes. gameplay, showing these things off, and it is really, really stunning. But first of all... Yeah, we're going to be ending with a sort of little nature documentary. I could, is that, uh, is that's it. nice. I like that. I'm that's not doing the Attenborough voice. But yeah, you should do the Attenborough voice. I, you don't want to hear me doing impressions. Oh, well, we're going to time. So hi, everybody, and thank you for coming along. Um, remember, if you didn't watch episode one, that was with Anthony Ross talking about the Stellar Forge. That is on video on demand. We are going to be doing another episode of Discovery Scanner. By the way, do you like my new T-shirt? <laughs> we're going to be doing a, 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 another episode of that in about uh, two another two weeks' time, so it's going to be sort of a bi-weekly type thing where we just take take deep dives behind the scenes and I think it's really cool uh, and thank you for saying happy birthday everybody that's very kind that was on Monday but I appreciate that uh, and all the good ones are here we've got uh, Ian Phillips Millstone Barn Wraith Bobby Streams Hexa Stu Ether and Kev B Mac Deck DJ Juice Griefed all of the good ones Osric 42's are out as well and Howard, Howard Chalkley who's that hi there <laughs> um, when can we get that t-shirt in the store it's pretty cool isn't it I don't yeah, know if I you can wondering. it might even already be there on Spreadshirt I'm not Quite sure. Um, I know all right, you wandering around in that today. Uh, let's get Howard on. Somebody says hi. Like, hey, look, that's 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 the bet. That's the top level stream. That's plus premium. When everyone has to pay premium yeah. for the internet, that's when Howard Shaw can come on. He's... Uh, anyway, uh, so without further ado, I'm going to shut up for most of this and let yourself do the talking. Um, uh, so, why don't you kind of set up what it is yeah. that you that you're going to talk about? So. What I'm going to try and cover today is I've got a. Oh, I want to give you a little cool. peek into how something like the Thargons turns from a discussion around a table to something you can actually fight in game. Then I was spending quite a long time talking about why we made what we made, how we met, how they work, what exactly they do, and then the little demonstration at the end. Okay. So, Thargons in their current form started sometime during when players were playing 2.3. We were planning what we were going to do. We knew they would be an important part of the Thargoid fight, but we didn't know exactly what they were going to be. There might be some variation of ship launch fighter. The idea of doing large swarms like we ended up with was a wish, but we, we weren't going to guarantee it at the time. So we had several discussions, and basically it sounded like a really fun problem to work on. Mm -hmm. It took me about three days to sort of come to the temptation of working on a little prototype in my own time. <laughs> uh, sort of evenings, a few lunch times, and a couple of weeks later I had something that we were showing to artists and designers. James gave me some great uh, first pass engine and trail effects, and it was looking really, really good. Uh, finally we got to show it to David. A bit nervous at the time, sat down with David, spent an hour demonstrating what they could do, talking about what we might want to do with them in the future, what it might let us do, and short version is my plan for the next three months got completely pushed out of the way and turned entirely into make Thargons work. Awesome. Because of how good, because of how impressed everybody was. Yeah, it yeah. was That's cool. one of the most fun few months that I've had 
working on this project. Amazing. Uh, I've I've really enjoyed these things. Very cool. So how did we make them work? Before that, there's one question that I've been asked many, many times when the Thargons have come up that I'm going to take the opportunity now just to answer. It's some variation of, why didn't we use Boyds? For people who don't know what Boyds are, uh, you're not wrong in thinking that sounds like a made-up word. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of like Thargoids, isn't it, Boyds? But anyway, can yeah. I? It's a, it's a very <coughs> commonly taught and commonly used mechanism in computer graphics and games for doing flocks of birds, fish, alien griblies, that kind of thing. They are, I'm not going to go into the details. Uh, hey, the button works. <laughs> of course <laughs> it does, Mark. Of course it does. I wouldn't give you a It's my not first time using button. the button. Oh, yeah, it's all good. So, very brief overhead overview. They work in terms of three basic rules. If you want to see more, I suggest following that link. I'm not going to spend ages talking about what we didn't do. <laughs> but there are reasons we couldn't use this that boil down to the two main design goals that we had with the Thargons. The first of which was that Boyds are, getting technical, a chaotic and divergent system. What that means is that if you make a small change now, run the simulation for two minutes, then compare it to how it would have been without the change, completely different. You, you get the butterfly effect, small changes would mean to lead to massive consequences, which when you're trying to network it, isn't a great thing. There's lots of compromises that you can make. We prefer to design around it and not have to make those compromises. The system that we've ended up with is a convergent deterministic system, which means that even if errors do show up, we guarantee they're going to get ironed out. Everyone's always converging on the same answer, which is really useful. And the other side is that voids, while simple, don't give you a lot of control. And we had a lot of ideas of, we wanted, to form, we wanted them to form up into interesting shapes, into pretending to be the Thargoid Interceptor. You can do it with voids, they're not the best choice. I like the analogy I like is you're starting with a sieve and trying to turn it into a bucket. It's just not a useful thing to do. Yeah. So what did we build? That is a excuse the programmer art. That's a summary of how they actually work. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, people don't mind. And most of the rest of this discussion is going to be me going through all of the boxes in this diagram, not sure which way I'm pointing, and explaining what they do, how they interact with each other and in as much detail as I can, how they do what they do. So, hey, buttons. <laughs> <laughs> to start with, there is something called the Swarm Leader object, uh, which is where the high-level AI is running. This is what's deciding who do I shoot next, where's a safe place to retreat to, do I need to go back and dock with my parent. It also acts as, for performance reasons, as a kind of hive mind. So. It's the thing that's probing the world to get sensor information where we can share it, rather than doing it all 64 times, one for each Thargon. The position of this swarm leader is networked, uh, and it is in fact the only position in the swarm that is that we're paying full bandwidth cost for networking. Everything else we're taking interesting little shortcuts. <laughs> uh, and as it's moving, it leaves behind a series of waypoints through which we draw a spline, which handily leads me onto my next little picture. For those who haven't heard of splines, uh, as far as I know, they've been in use since the early 1970s, uh, formed the basis of a lot of what uh, Pixar's graphics did. They're a really useful way of converting a series of waypoints into a nice curved line. Again, there's a link on screen if you want to read more, and I've given a, a version of the formula for them. There's a lot of different ways of expressing it. Uh, this is what I'm... I'm going to call it a quick deviation into my awesome tools for gameplay programmers toolbox. This is something that you should really know. I wish I'd known about that because I could have put like a little <laughs> sound and like a logo for this. No, go on. As, as yeah. Know. Marks, I tool tips. use these all over the place. I keep pointing up to the top left and that's just your face. That's, that's okay. Either way, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't use this face all over the place in the game. So, Catmull ROM splines, you feed them a list of 20 waypoints that the leader's drawn out and it will give you a very nice curve drawn between the 2nd and the 19th. So as the, sw as the leader objects are moving along, it's dropping waypoints ahead of the swarm and cleaning up things behind it. Hmm. We use this spline to get nice sinuous motion later on, as I will get there. Uh, excuse me. So then we get to the formation object. 
this thing is doing several jobs. Fundamentally, it's telling the swarm what shape it should be right now. And it's doing that based on three different layers, which annoyingly, I realize, don't actually correspond to the three different bubbles that are written next to it, but bear with me on this. So there's the high level formation they're running, which with names like flower, flow, tendril, basically all names that I've made up, that the AI is picking based on what it's doing right now. Is it firing guns? Is it firing missiles? Is it trying to run away? Is my parent nearly dead? Do I need to go and help it? All of these things go into the choice of which top level formation is it going to use. There's then a series of parameters that have come from mostly myself and artists controlling how fast that formation's animating, sort of subtle breathing animations, almost heartbeat like flutters as it's moving around. Hopefully you'll see all this stuff a lot in a lot more detail as we get later on. And you will. And then finally, there's a layer of what I can only call a big pile of maths, where it's <laughs> taking the parameters that we've worked out in that earlier stage and turning it into an array of positions. Uh, for the programmers out there, uh, a quick sample. This is most of the code for the simplest of the formations, which generates things aligned to circles, basically. You will have seen this in use in the new formation that the basilisk is using, uh, which looks like a kind of cone. And I can see I'm definitely confusing some people and making others really interested. So, yeah, this, you, you, this is great. It's perfect. Keep <laughs> going. People are enjoying themselves. Uh, if you, and please do put some... Um, uh, love in the chat for Mark as well, and, and do do let me know how, how interesting you are finding this. Uh, uh, thanks for coming along. Uh, Mr. Blob, not, Mo, not Notepad++, this is in the Visual Studio. This is a snippet of the actual code that we use. I've just stripped out some of the C++ shenanigans you need to do to make the compiler happy. Okay. Uh, but all the important stuff is there. So where these formations come from, they've basically all come from me having an idea for a shape, or one of the artists having an idea for a shape. I sit down, scribble half an hour's worth of geometry on a piece of paper, and then write a function like this that spits one out. Say so, hello. Just, just, so, just, <laughs> just so you feel good about what you're doing, people are really enjoying it. It's, it's yeah. important. Just want to go and meet these guys. Got to keep these guys. Happy. I enjoy talking right. about this stuff anyway. As I said, this was great fun to work on. <laughs> so observant viewers may notice that the output of that function isn't a position as you'd normally recognize it. So most things that we do are in Cartesian space. On the left, the x, y, z that everyone knows everyone knows relatively well, at least if you've had to deal with coordinates. The way we actually define positions in the swarm is based on the thing on the right. I guess technically the acronym is ZAL, but that just sounds weird. I call it swarm space for everything, <laughs> which is basically an extension of polar coordinates. Uh, People will come across those. Again, mathematicians will have come across those. I don't know. <laughs> don't know about everyone else. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Excuse me, I may be rambling a little. No, no, it's fun to keep, keep going. It's, it's genuinely so, very interesting stuff. A lot of the interesting motions that you get from the swarm actually have their roots in this original choice. Uh, it's not necessarily in obvious ways, but when you take this coordinate space where the z-axis is distance backwards, a is an axis is rotation around the z axis. Mm. R is a radius away from the z axis, and then L is local rotation. You treat it as if it were a linear space. You forget the fact that some of these are angles, and what you get is a situation where the shortest line between two straight li the shortest line between two straight points, two points. I get that wrong. Shortest line between two points is not a straight line. It's in fact a half spiral. So if if you imagine there's from me out to the camera, there's that z-axis. I've got a thug on that's here, and it wants to go there. Mm -hmm. In XYZ space, it would do that. In the way we've defined it, it's going to do that. Okay. Which gives that the fact that you're getting those kind of spirals is not all that happens to make it interesting, but is at the root of a lot of what, what I've been doing with these things. So it just creates more of an interesting looking, feeling pattern. Yeah. To them if moving. you've got if you've got a cylinder. Cylinders or cylinder of thargons, and you tell them all to move around a bit, rather than all of them going through the middle, they'll all spiral into position, mm. and it just fundamentally looks cooler. Excellent. Which is a lot of what we're trying to do. Mm. Uh, getting even more deep into the technical details, some people will notice that while we're trying to talk about six degrees of freedom, there's only actually four in this setup. Typically, you'd have X, Y, Z, and some rep representation of your pitch roll. Uh, 
Uh, your and pitch we construct much later, so we're actually dealing... I get to talk about dealing with things in four-dimensional space, it's just kind of fun. <laughs> uh, and it also means we can take... we can make maximum use of vectorized instructions in hardware that all of you are going to be running these days. We can basically calculate all four axes of this thing for the same cost as doing one of them, uh, yeah. because modern processors are awesome like that. So that's the, f the space that it's in. Uh, next. So you'll notice I've skipped over a big block in the middle. That is partially because going into detail would require a lot more time than I can stay tonight. Its job <laughs> is relatively simple. It is from the formation that we have a list of 64 positions that we want Thargons to be that makes it look like a donut, a circle, a big arrow pointing at space, whatever it might be. We've got 64 Thargons, we need something that matches up one to the other. That's this thing's job. It is constantly recomputing that map as members join the swarm, as they get shot, as you guys blow up flak mortars in the middle of them, uh, or every time the swarm changes formation. Uh, the rules it's doing that under again, are all basically carefully chosen just to make it look cool and to avoid intersections as they're moving around. Uh, I, going into depth on that one, as I said, would take quite a long time. Uh, don't tempt them, because they will <laughs> ask you to stick around for the rest uh, of the night to talk I'm about I'm fairly it. sure my voice would give out before I got, uh, it, got no, no, too no, far. No, so I can go get some water for you if you need, if need be. <laughs> I've already got some down there. Oh, good. That's good. So, assume the index map is doing its job. We then have the anchors which is the mechanism by which a Thargon talks to the Swarm. So the reason I call it as an anchor is I kind of view it as a Thargon throwing an anchor, literally a ship anchor, into the Swarm and letting itself be dragged around by that. It's not what's happening, but it's a fun way of visualising it. Hmm. So at this point we are still in that four-dimensional Swarm space, uh, and one anchor is referencing a position in the, a position in the formation, which, as the index map update, is going to constantly change, and it's this anchor's job to smooth out that motion. I'm making hand gestures to the camera while no, talking no, to it. It's, it makes sense. Uh, sort of, yes, yes. No, it does, <laughs> it does make I'm sure it makes sense to, to most. So, sorry, rewind slightly. So, as well as the input to... So the anchor is targeting an index in the formation. That point can move. We'll deal with that in a moment. It's at this point that we also do large object avoidance. So, as people fighting the Thargons will have noticed, when they charge at your ship, they, kind of, they come straight at you and then burst, around, burst mm. around you. That's what happens in this layer. It's looking ahead and saying, hey, I'm flying too close to the ship. Let's manipulate the shape of the formation so that I don't actually hit it. Unless they want to hit you, which is a totally different story. So, collapse the tangent, get back to where we were. The anchor is trying to get to a position in swarm space. It does this with my second deviation into awesome things gameplay programmers should know, <laughs> and that name has changed since the last time I said it. <laughs> <laughs> Mark's developing tools. Which is critically damped springs. So we're all relatively familiar with the concept of a spring. You have, you dangle away from a spring, you pull it down, it brings mm -hmm. back into position. Mm -hmm. In a more mathematical sense, a spring, uh, a spring acts to return to its starting point with a force proportional to how much it's been moved. Uh, the reason I'm showing this graph is it because it, it shows how springs behave under different amounts of resistance. So the top, I should have put this where I can actually see it, the top black line where sigma equals zero gives you a nice sine wave. That's an undamped spring. Thank you, Ed. Uh, sigma equals two is an overdamped spring. Sigma equals one, which is what we used, use is the perfect place, is a critically damped spring, which basically means it is pulling, it pulls one end to the target as quickly as it possibly can and is guaranteed never to overshoot, never to oscillate. It's a really useful tool to turn discontinuous input into nice, continuous, smooth output that looks really organic. It's actually not a bad model for how physical humans and biological things move around. Wow. Uh, it's not a perfect model, but it's a really, really close one that is very fast to compute. So I use these things all over the place. Wonderful. Um, the other advantage that they have is that they are 
barring a few exceptions, frame rate independent. So you can guarantee that if you're running at 15 frames a second or 150 frames a second, you'll get exactly the same motion out. A lot of smoothing techniques, as I'm sure people will have noticed, aren't always frame rate independent. You can get some strange results. That's just a, a useful side effect. Mm. Uh, it's worth mentioning that I've said the anchor is attached to the formation by effectively a four-dimensional spring. You can also think of it as four one-dimensional springs. They're all slightly different in how they behave. So the spring that's pulling them forwards and backwards isn't the same strength as the spring that's pulling them left, right, and around. And does, that, does the strength of that change, or can, can it change? Yeah, and the, the strength of each spring changes only very slightly, but changes based on what each Thargon is currently doing, mm. how far away it is from the centre of the pack to make it catch up. And there's some subtle changes to avoid them going through each other as well. Again, there's several months' work went into this. I can't go into detail on all of the little decisions that were made. Mm -hmm. uh, just to pick something out of the chat. Yep. JSB, I'm not clear what you mean by damp. Damp is basically resistance to motion. So if you think of a spring oscillating, if you think of a situation you've got a ceiling, spring dangling from that ceiling, heavy weight on the spring, mm -hmm. pull it down, let it ping up, it's going to shake around for a while. Mm -hmm. If I do the same thing in treacle, it's going to slow down a hell of a lot quicker. Treacle damps the oscillations. There you go. JSB. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, damp equals reduced size of next oscillation. Robert and Bell. you may be right that that zeta, my memory of Greek letters, is a little <laughs> bit limited right now. <laughs> Honestly, this, this man <laughs> usually knows his Greek, his Greek alphabets. Uh, I, well. I did study it about 16 years ago. Okay, that's a long, that's time, a long ago. time ago at this point. Yeah. <laughs> so we now have an anchor that's still in this four-dimensional swarm space that's somewhere relative to the swarm leader. Mm. What's the next stage? Uh, yes, there's one. We get the motion targets, as I call them. Excuse me, going through my notes. It's all good. At this point, we convert from that swarm space back into traditionally known x, y, z coordinates. With one little quirk that's worth pointing out is that that z axis, remember back from this thing, mm -hmm. that z axis is not a straight line. That z axis is distance along the spline that the leader left. So if you've got a 300 meter long swarm that's taken a few turns, the whole space is deformed to make a big cylinder or snake as it's going around. So at this point, we're back in three-dimensional space. We, the anchor has been converted into a target that the Thargon can head towards. But by itself, at that point, it kind of looks almost like a pouring fluid rather than a swarm of creatures, which in itself is kind of cool. But we wanted to add a little layer of indecision, of sort of unpredictability to the motion of each individual little Thargon. We do that with my third little deviation into awesome tools for the game programmer's awesome toolbox. Tools. Harmonic oscillators. Marks awesome tools. Harmonic oscillators. Yes. So, technically, superposed harmonic oscillator. Stripping out the jargon, sine waves added together. Same thing, basically. So, what you have here, you should be able to see in seven different colours, there are seven different little sine waves. And the big black one is all seven of those added together. What we do is use a signal very much like this, a little bit slower, but same thing, to generate small forces added to the motion target that push the Thargon around in a unpredictable, but quite organic, quite rhythmic, quite recognizable mm -hmm. way. Uh, it's a really useful tool. Again, just it makes very live, very organic motion. This is all over the place in the flight model for Elite, in bits of the weapon code, in bits of AI. Uh, it's even used in lag, lag compensation in a few places. Mm. These are, are really useful multifunctional tools. Uh, again, the equation's on screen if you want to know more. Uh, and have the other useful advantage for this process, that they're completely deterministic. Which means all I need is a timestamp, and I can tell you, all I need to replicate over the network, I mean, is a timestamp and I can tell you what the numbers are going to be for the rest of time, which is really, really handy for dealing with networking and keeping the bandwidth low. And I'm pretty sure there's stuff in my notes that I've skipped over, but... It's OK. No, you do, you're doing a fantastic <laughs> job. Uh, take a break. Uh, Make sure you have a little water break for a second. That was a good, sure point. good point, actually. Otherwise, otherwise, yes, we need, we need you at 100% for this. 100% right now, you're doing an amazing job. It's really good. 
Uh, so I was with you all the way up until simply. See, that's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, right. Moritz Elders, it is not per the same as Pearl and Noise. It does perform a lot of similar jobs. It gives you a nice continuous noise information. Uh, but it has some really nice properties that Pearl and Noise doesn't. Uh, which is the biggest one for me is that it just fits organic things better. Rather than where Pearl and Noise, you can quite easily get things that stay in the, in the way of drawing it there above the line for a while, wiggles around above the line, goes below the line, stays there for a while. Mm. Using sine waves, because they're always periodic, means that it, it never gets stuck in one corner, it's always oscillating over the full range. It's... It, this is a very subjective thing, but I found that whenever I needed something to wobble around, this is a really great way of doing it. Interesting. Um, like I said, I use these all the time. They're one of my favourite little tools. And again, on modern, modern hardware, can be done really fast, which is always an advantage. I forgot where we were now. <laughs> yes, I was talking about the motion targets. So, we've got the position in 3D space, we've added a layer of indecision to it, but at the moment, there's still nothing on screen that you can actually see. This is all happening <laughs> in the hive mind brain of the swarm, okay. deciding where things should go. So we need to get to the last step. We need to actually have the Thargons visible. So the Thargons are being pulled towards the motion target by basically another layer of springs. It's a different layer of springs to the early one. earlier one. It's happening in Cartesian space, they're different strength, there are different limits on them. But essentially it's the same tools we use to turn, we use at the anchors to follow the formation targets. And if, sorry, go where, where do these anchors know where to, to go? Where, so what is telling the anchor where to place itself before it's, the, the it's lead a to head to? Big chain of things. So the Thargon has thrown the anchor into the swarm, and the Thargon is throwing that. Yeah. So the, the, swarm. the Thargon, when it's created, attaches to the swarm and yes. sticks an anchor in it. Yes. The formation index map then decides, well, okay, you're near this side of the swarm. There's no one in your way. I'm going to assign you to position 17 in the swarm. Mm -hmm. The anchor is going to start getting dragged in swarm space towards that position. The Thargon's being dragged towards the anchor in mm. world space, and it's going to reach its target eventually. Okay. Uh, it's a continuous process as these things are moving around. Uh, this possibly will make more sense once I start trying to demo it live. Okay, okay yes. I th I, <laughs> sorry, I, d I didn't mean to. Ed wasn't um, listening earlier. I was listening. And I know that you said it, it's just I, I was thinking more along the, 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 the larger scale of, of when it's got a target to try and attack. Yeah. So the individual Thargons aren't making that kind of decision. It's the hive mind at the leader that's making the decision of who do I shoot. Okay. It's leading all of them towards the target and telling all of them to shoot that, that guy. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Important information, never let them. Sorry. <laughs> yes, and, and uh, make sure you're all taking notes because uh, there will be a test at the end, of course, as well as there was course, with. And I don't know what's going to be on the test yet, so. Ed acts like he knows what he's talking about. Shut up, Mr. Blub, <laughs> shut up. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, right. It's at this point that effectively what we have is a Thargon with a spring tucked to its nose that's pulling it around. Yeah. But the thing connected to the other end of that spring is what you can see on screen, this big arrangement of stuff, maths, code, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, and it's also at this point that we reconstruct the yaw and pitch for each individual Thargon, which if you remember we chucked out way back in the, in the uh, coordinate space which I mentioned, I don't know how many minutes ago. Yes. 15. <laughs> Ooh, is something gone? No, no, no! It's back. Okay, uh, one second. Uh, that's the, that's not happened for a long time. I do apologise. Are we back? Are we back? Hello. Are we around? Uh, what? Where, when did we stop talking? Stand down. All right, it's back. All right. Which bit of the rant do I need to re do invent again? Uh, it's just make, make sure you press the F5 button if you if you aren't seeing us. Um, okay, sounds a bit off. That's interesting. I do apologise. Mm. What we might do is just really, really quickly press the stop streaming button and start streaming button again uh, to maybe just re re refresh things a little yeah, bit. Yeah, we can do. Um, 
They lost about 20 seconds, okay. Um, Sounds just, like they lost me awesome talking So yeah, what were we talking about? Start again <laughs> from it simply. Okay. Too much math broke the internet. I'm afraid there's no way of getting through this without a lot of math. Are you guys, yeah, is the sound okay? Is, is, is everything, is all right? once, once we have enough people saying it's okay to continue, then we will continue with today's lecture. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, yes, reloading does well, okay. Uh, we announced the test, apparently, so... Okay. So, I'll try and rewind. Apologies if I repeat something. All good. Okay, so, fine. at this stage, we've worked out where the Thargon wants to go, and we're basically dragging it towards that target with a slightly elaborate, well, a fairly elaborate spring. Uh, it's at this point that we reconstruct the yawn pitch of each individual Thargon. If you remember back at... Yeah, your buttons. At this point, we're dealing with, effectively, X, Y, Z, and roll. We've ignored yawn pitch. We're going to come and do that later. Now is later. Uh, and also at this point, we do small object avoidance. Uh, what I mean by small objects is pretty much the missiles that you're firing at the Thargons trying to take them down. Uh, some players may have noticed they are very good at dodging missiles. That happens at this level. Mm. Effectively, as a, when a missile is flying forwards, we cast a capsule forward ahead of that missile. Any Thargons in that oh, area wow. are told, get out of the way please and they're, as part of that spring simulation they're pushed out of the way of the missile which means you get the kind of funky effect that I always think looks a lot like punching jelly not that I've done much punching of jelly but <laughs> <laughs> well, you imagine punching jelly looks like but you, I mean I've yes. seen other people punch jelly in slow motion before Pos so. yeah, probably yeah. on YouTube I have seen jelly being yeah, shot, yeah, punched yeah. and kicked all over the place uh, you missed something really interesting to me earlier on when we were setting this up um, about how they're just, you just made them really good so, like you're saying about how sometimes it looks as if they're making strange movements to move out of the way of things, but yeah. you've just made them so good at it that they just react really. You can well. very occasionally hit them with a missile if you're lucky, but they, yeah, they get out of the way pretty effectively. Mm -hmm. I did have great fun firing volleys of torpedoes at them. Mm -hmm. Torpedoes don't give up for I think two minutes, okay. and you just have the swarm <laughs> sat there with torpedo constantly going nope, following, <laughs> nope, nope, <laughs> nope. Great, that's that's interesting. It was great fun. Yeah. Uh, so I think at that point I'm done with the explanation. There are probably bits that I've accelerated over and skipped a little bit, but if there's really obvious things that people aren't connecting, I guess we can answer questions later. Later on, yeah, we can, if we've got some time to at the end. Um, uh, so I just wanted to quickly point out that um, people are starting to get a good idea of what the Frontier Development's uh, Christmas party looks like, with Mark just <laughs> going around punching people's jelly on the tables. Oh, that is a very... Anyway, weird idea. <laughs> but I'm going to have to think <laughs> very about that one. Very strange. Uh, but you, uh, you have genuinely well, made something very, very awesome. Here. Yeah. So, in summary, I think what we've made, as you say, is something kind of awesome. Is something that is just more real and more alive than the sum of its parts. Mm -hmm. There's so many things working in concert that it's not always obvious what each part is doing until you look at it as a whole mm. and see what you've ended up yeah. with. That's the thing you said you're quite proud of, is the fact that actually it's a relatively simple set of tools that you use quite yeah. a lot, but put together in a so really interesting way. A lot of these tools are stuff that I've actually used elsewhere in Elite already. Mm. It was, the really interesting part was, well how can I reuse these tools? How can I build this construct of different things to make really cool new results? Excellent. And as a minor aside, what we've actually ended up with, or what we've got here, is really, really efficient. So one of the concerns we had looking at uh, procedural formations to start with was that they might be quite expensive to run and quite expensive to calculate. What we actually have is that a swarm of 64 Thargons is cheaper than most ships in the game. Oh wow. Uh, it is very, very little data being networked. The formation code is all heavily vectorized and all run on background threads. The only really expensive part of them is physics and figuring out if they've hit anything as they're flying around. So. Uh, I'm kind of proud of that one, basically. Oh, good. And round of applause, and please, in the chat for, uh, for Mark's <laughs> creation of the Thargoi. Uh, and despite all of the interesting construct we have going on, and the fact that they are relatively quick quick to run, they still all act semi-autonomously, they can still detach and fire themselves at missiles, and really importantly, they're still consistent over the network. If we're both playing and you, you fire a flak mortar that blows up three of them, the same three are going to die on my screen as well. It's an achievement. Yeah. And that may sound like it Good. should just happen to non-programmers. Programmers will understand why I'm pleased with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, I was like, yeah, obviously. Yeah. No, no, I think that people, players of Elite Dangerous do, do, do have an appreciation for that, certainly. Uh, will Stevenson, how does it reduce bandwidth? That is something I actually haven't touched on probably enough. So normally, 
or a more traditional way of networking this would have be to have 64 networked objects all sending position orientation and velocity information as fast as they need to. What we actually have is one object, not 64, sending that information, and 64 objects sending their health. Because the position of each of the Thargons is calculated on every client. So it doesn't need to be networked. It's as simple as that. Well, simple. Again. Use that old that word simple <laughs> again. Uh, well, is it, simple can be seen from several sides, I think. Is it almost time to, to, to demo this? Yeah, I think this might make more sense to talk about some of this stuff. Give me a moment to actually get the demo up and running before we okay, try and run it. That's fine, that's fine. Uh, so that's completely fine. And control the right computer. Control the right computer. Yes, you've got the right mouse. Very good. Right. Uh, oh, bringing us back here while Mark does some uh, controlling of the PC. Thank you, everyone, for coming along. Remember, tonight is a deep dive into uh, uh, how the Thargons were created by the, the, the father of the Thargons here. <laughs> in a uh, way, yes. In, in, in a way, or at least you were an inspiration for their movement. You were almost like their dance teacher. Yeah, so, the, I mean. <laughs> As I said, Sarah did the high-level AI, James did all of the VFX, we got lots of artists did some great work on this stuff, but all of their motion, all of their swarming behaviour, that's all me. That's all. Fantastic. Are we ready to bring up the screen now? Or uh, I can very nearly. For us here. Just give us, the sh give us the nod when we're ready. Uh, let's get nice and close in camera view. And this is going to be a way you've never seen the Thargons before, uh, Thargons before and I think it's pretty exciting, actually. Uh, yep, that looks good to me. You ready? Yep. Okay, there we go. So what we have here is a little, a window into our dev build. Uh, it's an internal. I'm trying to read, read chat and speak at the same time. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> so what we have here is the same swarm that a basilisk can launch. We've got 64 thousand. Uh, rather than having a combat AI and rather than being launched from an actual thyroid, I've basically stuck this swarm in a little goldfish bowl, where I can make it wander around and do what I want it to, and get the camera up nice and close to show you what's going on. So what we have here is essentially their idle formation. This is what they do when no one told them to do anything different. Get the same again. Sorry, we It looked a little bit like there's a nudging up against each other now again. They do occasionally, yeah. So this was sort of designed... a bit of a little shot there. I do apologise, it is a deeper build. So all I'm doing at this point is, in fact, completely hands off, not even touching the controller. Well, apparently, so the gameplay is drowning out our voices a little. Sorry, I do ah. apologise. I've just, I've, I have just reduced them down. Sorry, I do apologise. They can be pretty loud once you get close. Yes. Is that right? Sorry. I uh, did notice that earlier. Forgot to mention it. Yep, I've, I've done that. I hope that's just let that was in the chat. Uh, and just out of interest, I did put together, did a little bit of working out. What you're watching here is one spline. 648 single dimensional springs and 1935 sine waves all working together wow. to make an awesome thing uh, JSB, yes, all clients in the swarm get the same posi positions calculated but they do that without having to network the individual positions, that's one of the reasons it's kind of cool so, as I said this is their idle formation when they're not doing a whole lot if I can just should have connected the tool earlier. That's all right, Tom. Yep. I can make them do things. For example, if I want to change what formation they're in, they form up into a nice new shape. This is ooh, camera controls. This is one I tend. Yes, I'm controlling the camera. I'm controlling it very badly. <laughs> it's stuck to the front of them. It's. It's. Uh, I don't wonder if you. I think I might actually have lost camera control. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, you just may need to click back onto the game. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Excellent stuff. There we go. Yeah. You can tell it's the first time I've used a debug build on stream. That's okay, don't worry, take your time. So, this is the formation that you will have seen the Basilisk using. using. I like to call it the counter cone because it's two counter rotating cones. I don't get complex with naming, form with naming systems. Oh. So, this is a good example I can use to show a little bit of the debug rendering that explains what's going on internally. Can I just very quickly point in somebody says your email showing on the screen. Don't worry, it, it's yeah. actually not. Uh, uh, that's it, it if you send nowhere. Yeah, that's not a real email. It's, it's not, not a real account. account. It's just developer hackery. So you get to see a little bit more behind the behind the scenes. That's 
you can see there's a green line now on screen. The swarm leader is effectively at the front of that line, leaving this little trail behind it that the rest of the swarm are interacting oh, with. Okay. There we go. Uh, and depending on which formation there is, in this case, it's not using the spline a great deal. In a much longer, more sinuous shape, it's you can see it's kind of aligned to the spine in some way. Back in. No. <laughs> Focus the right window, Mark. You're all right. You got it. If I then sh go back to, if you remember I mentioned formation targets, that's these little green shapes. Ah. I apologise if they jitter, jitter a bit. Debug rendering sometimes does that. So these are the targets where, where, where in the formation the Thargons are trying to get to at the moment. That will make a little more sense in a moment. The grey boxes are the anchors in the formation. And at the moment, it's kind of a spiralling nightmare. I'm not quite sure how well YouTube is dealing with this, but I guess we'll find out. The key thing to look at is how these shapes change when I tell it to change formation. So if I tell it to switch to a formation that we all have seen in-game, you will see that the green shapes move to the target instantly, the anchors smooth out some of the motion, and the Thargons smooth out the rest of the motion. So. Yep. <laughs> I will repeat this stuff afterwards yeah. without the debug rendering on. There. That is not the right button I pressed. Uh, no, nothing's happening. Oh, oh nice. So, I like that one. I think all this come through themselves. Yeah, this one's called Flow. It's one of my favourites, although it's actually probably one of the simpler ones to make as well. Oh, really? Um, you can see at the formation level, the green squares are moving kind of in a very square, square way. But the grey boxes and the Thargons themselves are staying very, very smooth and organic. If we get back to the cone. And what? <laughs> <laughs> Eventually okay, I'll get okay, it right. Yeah, no, it's okay. I will just turn that debug rendering off and you can see it in its true glory. So it is fascinating to see that. Here you have the counter coat. One thing I really like about this one, if you watch it, it can kind of be, 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 be a bit mesmerising. Yeah. But I'm feeling slightly hypnotised. The, the two cones aren't always moving at the same speed. If you keep watching it, sometimes one of them will seem to pause and the other one accelerates, then the other one will pause. It, it has a sort of constant... There's no obvious repeats to the motion. It makes it feel very alive. Absolutely. It so, makes it alive. Yes. Yeah, which it really <laughs> doesn't look that way. I kind of want this for a screensaver. You'd be astonished how long I left this just running while I was working something out, looking at something else at my desk. Yeah, they had the little nudges to every now and again. It's kind of cute. <laughs> right. Well, look at that one. What's going on here? This is back to their idle formation. Oh. I'm just using the editor to cycle through a couple of the formations that they can do. I'm forming them up into interesting shapes as they go. And uh, there are... Some of these formations you'll only have seen recently because it requires the more experienced Thargoid Basilisk to be able to control them. I need to click back onto the screen. Yep. Yeah. Like, like this one. So that's the Basilisk. Is, that's the Basilisk. It's the spoiler yes. for anybody who hasn't seen this. So that's yeah. what the Basilisk uses when it's firing missiles. Whereas is it the low... sticks around it? Is this, is this sticking around it? No, or? this is... It's kind of a... The Basilisk is a bit smarter. It can spread out the formation because if you aim a flak water in the middle of that, you're not hitting many Thargons. Right. Whereas the lower level ones use something more like that, oh, that where was you amazing, can take a huge chunk out of the middle of them. So can, can, I would quite, quite like to see you do a sort of dance to some classical music. <laughs> uh, oh, that would be changing them. That would be good fun. We could, do that for, we could do that for the 24 hour Christmas live stream. You could come on and, and make them dance to some We'd Christmas need someone music. with more musical tendencies than me oh, to set it up, but I'd, be, I'd love to be part of that. That'd be a lot of fun. The dance of the uh, Thargons. I'm picking up random questions as I see in the chat. Go, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Daniel Sayer, do, is the sound linked at all to formations or movement? It's not linked to the formations themselves, it's linked to the acceleration of each individual Thargon. Okay. So, yes, not directly, it's more of an uh, emergent thing, as I struggle to find the right words. Uh, it's, honestly, much take your time and just to play with whatever you yeah. want to do here. Cause to be honest, it's pretty fascinating. I find these things kind of mesmerizing. Yeah. I have literally just left the, left these things yeah. 
doing what they want on my, on my screen at work for probably a lot longer than I think. <laughs> I think people will let you off. Uh, and uh, it's and interesting, some people, uh, somebody said, just remember this next time someone says, oh, well, uh, Frontier could easily add this. Uh, add X feature or X feature or X feature. And, and the reason why, actually, in some ways, it is... It, uh, our, the developers at Frontier Developments, uh, as displayed by Mark, are, are very talented and uh, skilled at what you do. Um, I'm allowed to say it in a non-biased <laughs> way because, uh, you know, I'm just the guy who comes into the... Well, there's a lot more than that, but it doesn't matter. My point is, I, I see it from the outside as well. Yeah. And it, 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 the work, these guys are working on this incredible stuff all will, the time. I will say, with Thargons in particular, it started as my kind of little internal hobby project and then evolved a bit. But every time we brought someone else in new, the reactions I got from artist designers, from David himself, everyone loved this stuff. I love working on it, it's just great fun. And while we're here, there's just going to be a little sneak peek of something that we were going to use in the game. Decided not to for various reasons, but I think it's just kind of pretty. So they can form up into some quite much more rigid formations if we want them to, such as a double helix. So it doesn't make sense from a gameplay perspective, but it looks really beautiful. Basically, yeah. yeah. This was. Actually, it was something that David mentioned that I thought, I wonder if we could do that. Turns out, yes, we can. <laughs> They're just kind of nice. Yeah. Oh, be careful I don't turn that one. Yeah, it's an interesting point. Can, can, could the Thargons make a face? Could you... If you moved, I suppose if you manually moved the, the yes. anchor points. All, I mean, all, all it would need is writing a formation block of code that understands how to generate a face, <laughs> which is definitely doable. Too many ideas. <laughs> Too many ideas of having them out. Okay. Great. There's... As we were going to tease later anyway, you haven't seen all of the tricks that they can do. I'm going to just leave that there, completely unrelated to the whole face thing. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> they, do, they don't make faces. They don't but make faces, but, but, you, but you're saying that more... you haven't seen everything that they can do yet. No. There, there are... As Ed can probably see from the tool I'm using, there are several little I boxes can. that are not being used here. Yeah, no, hello. Um, um, I, I, see, uh, I see a lot of things on screen. Um, uh, as we saw with the basilisk, yeah. the, you mentioned that the basilisk is, is more intelligent and can use those yes. so Thargons in a, in a smarter way. That's essentially what's happening, yes. Okay. As, as the controller gets better, as it can hold on to more Thargons. Mm -hmm. And in fact, one thing that I'm not sure if people have noticed, Annoyingly, the, I had some issues with the tool, so I can't demonstrate right now. Mm. But as the parent gets more and more damaged, the swarm loses cohesion. The more stressed, so the cool. more damaged the parent's getting, the less it can control the Thargons, the more the shape breaks down into a mm. bit of a cloud. In extreme cases that you probably won't see, it can get up to something like that, which is just, ah, everything's gone wrong. Chaotic. But it still looks beautiful, though. Yeah, that's actually what they do just before the swarm, just before the swarm explodes, if you oh. kill the Thargoid before they die. And then they can jump back into whatever else you want them to do. Very yeah, cool. Fascinating stuff. Brilliant. Um, and that's and kind of the fun. Unless someone pokes me, I'm probably going to spend the rest of the day just watching. <laughs> 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 so that's it. That's the, that's, that's the Thargons. That's uh, essentially a, uh, a simplified uh, uh, description of, of, of how the Thargons came... Well, they're the movement yes. feel came to be. It's right? just one of the possible things that... We'll see if we can... Uh, let's get back into the camera. Oh, brilliant. We're going to shoot at them. Yep. Just, this is Why for not? no particularly good reason other than I find it quite amusing. But the pack counts. Yeah. Okay. Uh, make them fall up into a flower because it shows it off best. I mentioned they're quite good at dodging missiles, which pretty much guarantees they're going to fail to dodge every single one. But if we start firing pack at them. Yeah. The, of course, um, the small, what do you, small object, small object avoidance. Yep, that needs to play there. Uh, in fact, it's managed oh, to it? aim some of them back at me by mistake. How did, oh, interesting. Uh, it's a quirk that actually some people haven't noticed. Of if a missile loses its target, it will lock onto other targets that have a similar emission strength. Mm -hmm. Turns out that a Thargon's form and an asp look similar enough to a missile that it gets confused. Who knew? Yeah, it looks nice. Uh, yeah, I was listening, everybody. <laughs> oh, one of them actually hit. Maybe two of them. Oh, no. Poor little, poor little guys. I've, I've, I have a new affection for them now. <laughs> uh, these aren't AX missiles, they're just normal pack hands. I'm using them to, because they look fun. Mm. It's why I do a lot of what I do, to be honest. 
Uh, so, I mean, so, I'm sure there are lots of questions, and I think I believe that Osric did mention earlier on that he's been grabbing a few of those questions in the same way that Paige would usually do. Uh, if you could send those over to us, Osric, in, in however horrible way possible, if you have, but don't worry. Um, usually, sometimes after the streams, we get to look through some of the questions and then I mean, maybe put some up in a, in a separate thread yep. uh, if you've got the time to answer them, of course. Uh, Actually, one other thing that may be interesting, just to yeah, demonstrate yeah. without breaking too much, uh, one of the things that I can do is control the size of them. So if I pretend that lots of them are going to die. The fact oh. we're doing all these swarms procedurally means that it can constantly reform as members oh. join and leave the swarm. So how does it look like twenty sixty four? So if I... Obviously these aren't spawning as they would in game, they just materialise and okay. join yeah, in yeah, because yeah. it's a debug goldfish bomb. Mm -hmm. But the shape kind of expands and the new ones slot in. Oh wow. And it... It just based on the size of... Yeah, so this is the advantage of going with a procedural formation rather than doing anything doing it all based on orthodox animation. Without spoiling anything, Mark, um, that's not the highest number that can go, is it? Uh, I don't think 64 is the limit, no. Okay, right, well, that's it. That's where we're going to leave it here for today, I think. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mark. Is there anything else that you want to more, more no. you want to say now? We do have eight minutes. If people do want to put some questions in for the next uh, yep. few minutes, uh, more than happy, we can let these guys swarm about in the background while we answer some questions. Uh, um, bring them through, Mark. If you just want to grab whatever you want to grab from here, um, or to you, uh, can you put them in. Someone's sort of. Yeah, I'm more than happy to answer questions. Someone wants to see one of them up close. So Ooh, let's lock the camera onto this little boy. Wait. Where's he gone? There he is. Cap debug camera's not really designed to do this, but never mind. Yeah, this is real behind the scenes. Yeah, but look at those things. You can tell that a lot of time and effort went into the individual model. Yeah, it's very cool. It does get a bit jerk. <laughs> yeah. Just turn that off before I make someone seasick. <laughs> uh, very cool. Uh, are you going to use the swarm tech on new NPCs? I'm not sure that's a relevant question. Oh, okay. Uh, any questions about the creation of uh, Ed? The Gallant logo is the same as the Thargoids. No, that's uh, uh, again, is it? But no, no. As a law point, do they have pilots? The individual ones don't know. They're all. I'm not sure exactly what the law is, but it's sort of like ants. It's kind of how how hive mind. Yeah, so they're, that's what I they're a hive mind way. controlled from the parent. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, how much strain does sixty four put on memory? Very little. The per thargon data. I haven't actually measured it, but it came in small enough that it wasn't worth measuring in detail. If anyone's wondering, I'm just manually flying the camera around while watching them do things. Nice. Um, Thargon versus Thargon fight. <laughs> have you ever done that? Uh, I didn't. I did have them swarming anacondas and the point defense lasers shooting back, which oh, kind of fun. That was amazing. Uh, interesting. Uh, what kind of code do you use to generate their flight patterns? Tom Renegade. Um, that's kind of. Well, is that. Yeah. Is that, so, is the, that a new question? <laughs> the structure of the code is all the stuff that I was explaining for the mid 25 minutes or so of this okay. presentation. So, yes, yes. I was going to say. Uh, in, in terms of detail, it's this. all C code. Yeah. Um, it's, mm -hmm. yeah, that's about it. The prototype was all C as well. I saw that answer came. Mm -hmm. That question came past earlier. Uh, the only difference. The only functional difference between the prototype and the real one is that doing the prototype, I took a lot of shortcuts and wrote some really horrible code, because it's much quicker to do it that way. Mm -hmm. And then wrote some much nicer code for the real one. Awesome. Uh, Netwise IT com, it is all processed on the local machine. Uh, doing it on the server would have too many latency issues to do that route. Olivier Vesper asks about setting this one to a larger size. We, we won't be doing that today. This is We're going to be leaving it here as, as they are seen currently in the game. Oh, it's okay, Tom Renegade. I, just, I was just double-checking. I didn't, I didn't know. Because for all I know, you're a programmer and you're like, well, actually, no, that's a very specific question. So that's why I was asking. Definitely check back and watch this live stream uh, throughout and you'll, you'll learn all about how the patterns and stuff were actually coded by, by Mark here, uh, which, is, which is incredible that you did this. And again... It, it, is it? Do you enjoy working at Frontier Developments on these things? Because you said that this yeah. was the thing that you enjoyed doing the most. And I mean, you're continue. You're sticking around on Elite, right? I have and, no and plans I, to I think it's very, very important that people know that that is what's happening. The people that we're showing, the people that we're bringing onto these streams, are working on Elite Dangerous currently. We'll continue yeah. to work on Elite Dangerous. The team is as strong as it ever has been. We're still working on Elite Dangerous, and we're still, and it's going from strength to strength. Yeah, I mean, I came onto this project shortly after the Kickstarter ended, and I. 
basically bulldozed my way onto the project, I think. I really wanted to work on it. Okay. If I wasn't going to work on it, I was going to be in all the alphas and betas anyway. <laughs> Playing? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I bought Alpha Access before I even knew I was going to be on the team. Alex, what else What else were you doing before um, on Elite Dangerous before you did the Thargons? Uh, before the Thargons, I've been doing a lot of things for, actually, for Beyond that you'll be finding out later. Okay. Brilliant. <laughs> before the Thargons? Yes. So we're uh, working on that for quite some A time. lot of the stuff for Beyond has already been in... To do really cool stuff, you need to get the tools and technologies in place before you hand it over to designers to make, let them make things. Oh, so okay. That's Dangerous been thing. in the pipe for a while. Hmm. Cool. That's good to know. How much do I play the game outside of testing and debugging? Not as much as I wish I had time for. Uh, I've played probably about 20 hours in the last month on my personal account. Something like that. I'm currently in a third lance trying to persuade all the engineers to give me more exploding things. <laughs> Very good. Time for a couple more questions. Um, how is your work different from Sarah's? Uh, Sarah Jane Aries, uh, uh, one yes. of the lead pro uh, uh, AI programmers, or is she a senior? Or uh, she's a senior programmer. Right. Uh, so in context of the Thargons, what Sarah does is have them make the choice of who is the swarm going to attack now, are they going to go home to the Thargoid parent to, re to replenish their numbers. Mm -hmm. What I've been doing is once they've made that choice, how do they get there, how do they move, what shape do they form up into, how do their weapons function, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Brilliant stuff. Uh, <laughs> how? Uh, yes. So yeah. Well, lots of people want to see bigger swarms. I can do more than one swarm, but I can't do bigger swarms right now. But well, Osric makes an interesting point about how, how Beyond has been worked on. Obviously, not being called Beyond, but it, but but the tools and the things, the implementation yeah. for making and improving the core functions have been thought about for quite a long time. We've talked, we've told people that earlier that we were going to go back and work on those core functions and improve those. And so they've been worked on for quite some time by by the team still. What is also important to mention is though that doesn't mean, as you said, you pass it to the, to the the designers to then yeah. tweak those things in a way that they need to use those tools. So you improve the tools, then the designers can use those yeah, tools to make better things. Kind of the first step is us getting a version of the tool working, I and mean, then there's a lot of iteration yeah. and back and forth as designers work out what they need in more detail, we try and answer their questions, see what they need, sit back and forth to get the tools the designers need to make awesome things. Because the important thing is as well that we've been awesome. doing these for these focused feedback sessions as well that um, uh, we're asking people for their feedback about our proposals about the yes. about certain certain um, things that we're doing in the game and uh, I, I want people to realise that that feedback is being taken on board and actually is being implemented in. It's not it's too late for that is, is my point no. I'm trying to make. Uh, in a, ra in a, in no, a very complicated roundabout way. Still very much an internal iteration and mm. prototyping of things. Uh, Ed, can we get future streams info from the Lit Launcher? That's a very nice, uh, nice suggestion. Yeah, we should start putting uh, a schedule together of these uh, so people know. Uh, we have another one of these, and, and I want to say another, first of all, a huge round of, uh, round of applause in the chat for oh. if you could just do these little clap symbols. I've seen them. They look like this. Put Thanks those in for the bringing me on and letting me waffle for well, Have you, have you enjoyed it? Oh, definitely. Good. I, Will you I come really back and again and do another stuff. session, maybe about sort of because you also uh, work with um, sort of calculating damage from from yes. from the firing point to the point yeah, of the so, thing being hit, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, so all the weapon mechanics, flight model, a lot of the balance is also stuff that I've spent four years working on. It's just an interesting that that um, calculation alone is, is fascinating to me of how yeah. that, the damage is calculated based on what everything that works together. If people want to hear it, I'm more than happy to talk about cool. it. Well, 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 I'm sure that they will. I'm sure that we can come back with a... Uh, uh, a uh, Sorry, I'm, I'm distracting myself. It's okay, don't worry. Space please again. Uh, another episode of, of the Discovery Scanner. Uh, we'll be doing Discovery Scanner 3 at some point. It will be not next week, but the week after that we'll be doing Discovery Scanner. Next week, I believe cool. that we have Sandy back coming on and talking about the next next stage of focused feedback for Beyond series of updates. But well, the week after that, again, I've got to confirm with Sandy first of all about that, so don't take that uh, as, as read just now. But uh, after that, we'll be doing Discovery Scanner again. Uh, we don't have the, nail the topic nailed down, because there's a few that we've been discussing uh, for episode three, but we'll let you know as soon as possible in the newsletter. Perhaps I can put it up in the launcher to, to, to attract people. It's a very nice suggestion. Good, good suggestion. I should write that one down. Yeah. Um, That's cool. Oh, hello. 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 Hi. Oh, nice and close to the camera for little kids. <laughs> uh, right. And uh, yeah, very interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, I might just leave this swarming around um, for a couple minutes now uh, to, 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 close, off, to yeah. close off the stream. So again, um, thank you so much, um, Mark. 
Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. And thank and you so thanks much. everyone for watching. I'll see you next time for another Discovery Scanner. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.